Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nineteen years ago, a young man came to this General Assembly for his first time. He was a new Christian, a very new believer, had had a lot of trouble in his younger life, and had just been redeemed by the Lord. Full of hope. Full of hope that somehow the Lord would take that life that had staggered and, and fallen and had never really gotten going and put it together. And as I sat here, I knew six people at that time out of 20-something thousand. And with my one pair of jeans and, and two shirts and nothing else, I arrived here and was amazed when I saw the brethren worshiping the Lord. That was the most amazing thing. I don't remember any sermons. I don't remember singing. I can't remember much from that time so long ago, but I remember the worship. I remember the, the feeling that overtook me as so many thousands of people lifted their hands and hearts and voices to the same Lord that I knew and loved. It melted me. I'd never seen anything like that. And it occurred to me tonight, with this wonderful presence of the Lord that is here, that not much has changed. The same Lord is still being worshipped and adored. Some of us were here then, and there may be some new ones here now. But it's the same God, and He's still going on. He's not asleep. He's not on vacation. He's not resting. He is the Lord. And He's here tonight to do battle for us. I'm excited what God is going to do. In fact, I'm thrilled. I, I'm anticipating that the Lord is going to do something wonderful. And I, I thank the Lord for having kept me to this time that uh, I have been able to see and prove Him. He's a good God. He's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Lord. And He loves us so much. Praise the Lord. The topic that has been given to us tonight is laborers together with God, moving as God moves. That, of course, you recognize as taken from a passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, and I'd like to invite you to turn with me to that passage tonight. I'd like to read the first nine verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the writings of the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. Praise the Lord. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are, as, ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal, and walk as men? For one saith, I am of Paul, and another I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth, and he that watereth, are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. With harsh words, the Apostle Paul draws the Corinthians' attention to the fact that their divisions had rendered them carnal and immature. In chapter 1, he had pointed out that they had taken on party labels and had quadrisected the church. Some of them, while boasting of one party or another, were really carnal people. Some of them were marching under the label of Paul. Others lifted up the banner of Apollos. Some thought that Peter was the way to go. Others said, we march under the banner of Jesus Christ. And this whole first movement in the book of 1 Corinthians builds the argument that Paul is trying to produce for them that they were, in fact, 
carnal and bringing division to the body rather than edifying it. What they were doing was ultimately counterproductive. They had debilitated the body of Christ. And he builds his arguments, shows them step by step by step their error. And finally, in the third chapter of this book of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul reaches his climax and points out to them that really, Apollos and I are not in opposition. In fact, we are laborers together with God. We're not working against each other. We are working with God and with each other. This, I think, is the ideal. This, I believe, is the very highest point that we can see the way the church should operate. Laborers together with God, for God, in God, through God, that's what Paul was trying to get them to understand. Now, as this is the passage that has been given to us this evening, I would like to invite you to follow me as I try to, uh, to examine this with you. It naturally divides itself into three points, and I'd like to follow all three points with the hope that somehow the Lord would cause us to come to a clear understanding as it seems to be an important theme for this General Assembly. I have been surprised, and pleasantly so, how each message and each song and each devotional seems to have built toward this theme. And I suspect that it's going to carry on through to the end of the week. So follow with me, please, prayerfully, that the Lord would help us to understand as we march our way through these three points and perhaps the Lord will speak to us. Point number one that comes from this very passage, we are laborers. We know that the same God who has saved us has also commissioned us. In the Old Testament, God formed and chose a people for himself. Israel experienced personal, uh, personally the saving touch of God. I don't know to what extent they really experienced this. I doubt personally that it is the way that we experience the touch of the Lord. But somehow, through the Lord's mystery and means, he touched them and they experienced God. And as such, they became God's interpreters to the rest of the world. They quickly came to understand that their duty was more than just Israel. But God had chosen them to fulfill his promise to Abraham to be a blessing to all the nations. And it was to this that they were designed and for this reason that they were selected. However, if we carefully read the New Testament account of what Israel had failed in, it is this, that somehow they had become enclosed and they had not succeeded in reaching out and sharing their bounty in the Lord with the others. And so this necessitated Christ coming. And when Christ came, he took it upon himself and he proclaimed and established the kingdom of God. You know this. This is nothing new. It's certainly nothing deep. It was God's intention through Jesus to establish a spiritual kingdom on this earth. That he did. And the church received the commission and the responsibility to perpetuate the work that he had begun on into the future and to become a spiritual Israel and to share what God had shown to them with the rest of the world. Praise God. <laughs> Therefore, to be a Christian in the truest sense of the word is to be a laborer with God. We were called to work. If I understand this correctly, we were called to be busy doing his work. That's why we're here. 
Israel failed in this. We have been called to succeed. Unfortunately, there is no easy road to becoming a laborer for God. Because in order to be a laborer for Him, our will has to die in order to take up His cause. I believe that's true. And I think that's the challenge before all of us. Near the end of Jesus' ministry, he was walking toward Jerusalem with his disciples, and behind him were a group of people that were interested in Jesus. They had heard about him. Some of them had probably heard him preach. And they followed along thinking, well, maybe the master will turn around and tell us something. They followed him along, and as this little procession made its way, others joined them when they recognized that the one in front was a man of notoriety, Jesus. And finally, the procession stopped as Jesus went into a house to visit a friend. As he was inside, those who had followed him, no doubt, sat on the dusty road, leaned against trees, sat on rocks, and waited for him to come out. As people would pass by, they would ask, what's everybody gathered here for? And they would say, you know who's in that house? Jesus is in there. The Jesus? Yeah, the Jesus. The one who's made such a stir in Galilee. That's the same one. He's in that house. We're waiting for him to come out. And some of them said, well, I've heard about him. I'm going to wait too. Maybe he'll tell us something. Finally, the door opened and Jesus stepped out and began to walk along the road. Everybody got up, straightened themselves out, and followed the Lord. You can imagine the scene, walking through the neighborhood, people standing in their front yards, watering the, the plants, washing their chariots, seeing this procession making its way down the street and saying to each other, who's that in the front? That's Jesus. I'm going to follow too. Until finally the Bible tells us there was a multitude. All of them listening, hoping that he would say something. Finally, when the multitude was gathered, Jesus stopped and turned around. Every head bent forward. Every ear was braced and waiting, waiting to hear what the master would say. Some of them probably thought, I hope he tells us about love. I love it when he talks about love. It makes me feel good. Somebody else probably thought, I hope he tells us about power. I really like that message. I heard him preach that over in Galilee somewhere, how we have power over demons and devils. And whew, that's good stuff. I hope he tells us about power. What are you going to tell us about? I hope he tells us about unity. That's a good one. Every time he speaks, something happens. This is going to be good. And they're all leaning forward. They're all listening. They're getting the children quiet. The Lord turns and looks over the crowd. This is near the end of his ministry now. And as they are listening, he says to them, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself daily. Take up his cross and follow me if you would save your life you're going to lose it but if you will lose your life for my sake you'll find it this must have knocked them back three steps what are you saying did, did i hear that right that's not love that's not power that's not unity in fact that's hard Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Those are hard words. But the fact is, our duty as Christians is to do that very thing because we're here to work for the Lord. Paul said we are laborers. Laborers. In fact, our duty in following him is to somehow examine and discover his ideals and his plans and follow in his way 
and to continually check ourselves and to find if there's something in us that has gone a little bit astray and we're not quite following the way that we should go. Or maybe we've been caught up in the drift of contemporary religious thought. We need to be adjusting ourselves, I think, continually. In fact, in order to be a true laborer for God is more than just work. There's something of a kindred spirit with God in there. God's great and ancient servant who had such an impact on the church, the one that we know today is St. Augustine, prayed this prayer. He said, Oh God, may my heart be broken by the things that break your heart. That's the heart of a servant. That's the heart of a laborer for God. And in fact, it takes the very energy of God himself to make us laborers for him. It's not something that we can decide to do. It's not something that can be carried on in our own effort. And it just may be that herein lies the problem and the question and the, the uncomfortable feeling that is now prevalent in much of the Pentecostal, the classical Pentecostal world. See, the complaint is that in Pentecostalism these days, there is a shortage of true spirituality. In fact, in the, the largest Pentecostal denomination, the statistics show that only one-third of the members have been baptized with the Holy Spirit. The rest, the other two-thirds, are not. And this is distressing. It's a problem. None of us want to see this happen. But perhaps what has happened is this. When Christ chose his workers, when he chose those upon whom he would build the church, he chose ordinary folk. You know the ones. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. They, they were not the cream of society. But they had this one thing going for them. They loved the person, Jesus Christ, to the point of death. They loved him deeply. They were in love with Jesus. They were in love with him enough that they were willing to die for him. In fact, they were in love with him so much they were willing to live for him. And that may be the more difficult thing to do. And so these young, these, this group of people, this rough cut group of people were saddled with the responsibility of the church. And all they had to go on was a burning love of the Lord in their hearts. They loved him. But they were also given the church. They were given a system. They were given an organization. And that was good. It was necessary. When we read the New Testament, we see that there was rank and file in the church in the New Testament. There was administration and there was ministration. And I would like to remind you that those are not the same thing. All of this was there, but there was an inherent problem. The problem of any system is that in order to continue, it has to some degree promote itself. And as the system grew, men were required who could manipulate the system, who could exploit it and make it go. And so at first it was just men who were so intensely in love with the Lord. But after that, time went by. And what happened? Men were chosen who were in love with the Lord, but also were systems men. Men who could promote it. Men who could make it go. Men who had the gifts and the strengths to do it. And although they loved the Lord, it occasionally was easier to rely on their own abilities than to recklessly abandon themselves on the Lord. And as the time went by, suddenly there was a, a very insidious shift in criteria for the qualifications of leadership. No longer was it merely love the Lord, but suddenly... It became, you have to love the Lord and you also have to be a good administrator. And sometimes 
It's a hard line to hold. One wonders where, where to draw that line between administration and, and just blindly serving the loving, living God. Well, I don't know. I don't know what's, what's happened, but I, I do know that in order to be a laborer, we must, we must be in love with and have as our central focus Jesus Christ. We, we, we can't allow, we can't, we can't afford any longer nice, quiet, orderly ways of doing things. God, God's got to come in and, and stir things up and get us shaken and get us laboring for him again out of a passion for him just because we love him so much. Organizational skills will probably follow, but the center of our thinking has to be Jesus Christ. This, this year, I have found myself in a number of different places, and I have had to ask myself occasionally, Chris, what are you doing here? What's your purpose? What, what's your goal? What are you supposed to produce here, man? And as I thought about it, I, I had to check off the list to win souls. I had to check off the list to try to bring the church to another country. I had to check several things off the list until finally the only thing left on the list, list was to do the will of God. And maybe that's what we're supposed to be doing. As laborers of God, <laughs> we're supposed to do the will of God. I, I believe that so. I want to do his will. But we, we can't stop here because we need to move on to the second point before we run out of time, and that is we are laborers together. Not just laborers, but laborers together. We all know that there is going to be some heightened form of unity which will be realized by the church before Christ returns. We can see this happening now in Eastern Europe. It was my privilege a few months ago to be in Hungary. The brethren there had rented an auditorium, and the auditorium was full of people. The churches had come together, and I had been invited to preach, and I stood before the crowd, and I began to share with them from the 17th chapter of John about unity. An old minister there, a white-haired old loving fella, 70-something years old with a hearing aid in his ear and glasses that didn't quite fit right. But a man who had hazarded his life many times for the gospel of Jesus Christ and had established churches all over Hungary was moved. I had only preached about 10 minutes and this wonderful brother stood up and walked up to the podium in front of all the people and grabbed me and hugged me. And he couldn't speak English, but he had heard the word unity. And he said in his broken English, unity, unity, unity. And the tears flowed down his cheeks. And he hugged me and he said through the interpreter, how can we establish unity with the churches in Greece? that there is no longer just the church in Hungary and the church in Romania and the church in Greece. But how can we establish a unity that will be the church of God? And as he asked this, he was so broken in his spirit and he stood there and he pushed me gently out of the way and preached for 45 minutes on unity. Hallelujah! It was a wonderful thing. It seems to be happening all over Eastern Europe and I suspect also all over the world as God is doing something wonderful. God is doing something high and exalted, something that we have never dreamed before and it's happening. It seems that the Lord is lifting the vision of his followers a little bit higher. And the walls that have divided God's people for so long just don't seem quite as high as they used to seem. Now, I, I, I may be mistaken. 
This may be just my imagination, but this is the way that it seems to me. The attitude of them and us in many places is giving way to a new attitude of we. As brethren are recognizing each other on the other side of the walls. Well, praise God. I always wondered why those wonderful brethren that taught me in, in college and in seminary didn't see things the way I saw it. I knew they were good men. I had a professor that was, had so many doctorates after his name, spoke 12 languages, quite a fella. But he stood up and he wasn't one of us as far as Church of God of Prophecy. He wasn't even a Pentecostal. And he stood up and began to teach us the minor prophets. Those books had always been so dry to me. The first day of class he opened and he began to read from the book of Hosea. And as he read, tears welled up in his eyes. And he had to wipe his eyes to continue to read. And finally, he put the Bible down, put his hands on the desk, and just wept. He was so moved by the presence and the, the beauty of the book and what God was doing. He obviously was a man who knew the Lord, and there were others. But when it came right down to it, they just didn't understand things the way I understood them and had been taught them. That was a puzzle for me. How could that be? Men of such integrity, men of such love for the Lord, men of such intellect, <laughs> how could they come with the wrong conclusions? You're probably hoping I'm going to tell you. <laughs> I don't know the answer. If you do, <laughs> tell me after this meeting, please. But for me, the revelation of God to an individual remains a mystery. I, I can't explain it. But what I, I have come to recognize is that they also know the Lord. There's a certain sense of unity there with us and them because they know the same God that we know. I sense this unity in true believers everywhere. In Ephesians chapter 2 and 14, the Apostle Paul wrote some outstanding words. He said, For he is our peace, who hath made, a, made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. I'd like to point something out to you here. This is written in the past tense. This was not something that the Lord would do. <laughs> It's something that he did do. When he died on the cross, he broke down the middle wall of partition. In other words, the unity that we have been preaching, the unity that we have been praying for for so long and anticipating that thing that was going to happen has already been done. It's already accomplished. The unity already exists. It remains for us to discover it and to recognize it and to find it within the, the, the children of God. I think that for me, the problem was in confusion over two words. There's the word unity and then there's the word unanimity. And somehow... In my feeble mind, I, I got those words confused. It seemed that they became the same thing, but they're not the same thing. And I'm not speaking here tonight, so please don't misunderstand. I'm not speaking about the way we make decisions. That has nothing to do with what I'm trying to say. But what I would like to try to, to relate to you is that unanimity, which is an important word, is something external. It's doing things in the same way. It's expressing the same things. Unity, however, is internal. It's a certain bonding of spirit and mind. It has sort of a mystical quality to it. Unity, external. Unanimity, internal. Now, please listen. It is possible 
for a group to experience unanimity without experiencing unity. For example, a neighborhood might get together at a neighborhood meeting and decide that anybody in that neighborhood who commits armed robbery in that neighborhood must be punished. They might agree to that unanimously, 100%. But that does not mean that they have unity in the neighborhood. They may be completely divided. In fact, they may not even know who their neighbors are. Although they have experienced a certain unanimity, the unity is not there. Likewise, it is possible to have unity without unanimity. Are you with me? <laughs> oh, good. It is possible to have unity without unanimity. For example, let me give you an example of our own churches. If you ever travel to Egypt, you will find that in most of the churches, when the preacher stands in the pulpit, he is standing in front of a wall. The wall goes out from the pulpit perpendicularly, separating the church into two halves. The preacher can see both sides. On the right, the women sit. And on the left, the men sit. The preacher can see the women. The preacher can see the men. But the men cannot see the women. And the women cannot see the men. There's a middle wall of partition there. They, they just can't see each other because they feel that especially in the house of worship, men and women should be separated for all the reasons that you can conjure up in your mind. If you go north to Romania, you will find the church is packed full of people and there's no middle wall going down from the pulpit in the churches in Romania. But... <laughs> There are the women on the left and the men on the right. And you don't sit on the other side. I thought I would make a statement once while I was there and went over and sat on the edge. And I was quickly advised by several of the brethren, you're in the wrong place, brother. Get over there. Why? Well, because this is church and it just isn't right for the men and the women to sit together. Okay, but there was no wall there. In Romania, the men can look across and see the women. The women can look across and see the men. There is an invisible wall. They don't cross it. But if you were to go to Greece and you come to our churches there, you know what you will find? <laughs> Men and women sitting next to each other in worship service, standing, raising their hands, praising the Lord, and the pastors encourage the, the husbands to sit with the wives and vice versa. Now, what's happening here? What we have is unity of spirit, unity of covenant, unity of purpose, <laughs> but no unanimity in practice. How can such a thing be? Well, it's not so difficult to understand. They are united in the spirit, but they don't have unanimity on all issues. It's the same with our families. My family has only three people, my wife and my son, and we all like music, and we all like Christian music. We are united by covenant. We are united by blood. We're united by birth. We're one. I'll argue that with anyone. However, when it comes to Christian music, I like one kind. My wife likes all kinds. And we won't talk about the kind my son likes. He's only 12 years old. I used to like that too. We have unity, but no unanimity 
Well, praise the Lord. If unanimity becomes our goal as Christians, hoping that somehow that unanimity will produce unity, we're going to be disappointed because the very nature of unanimity forces us to patrol our frontiers looking for areas where we disagree. We have to always be looking where we're not matching up with each other, <laughs> which forces us to look at the wrong things. If we are on a quest for unanimity, when we find a place where we disagree, then somebody is going to be under pressure to give in for the sake of unanimity. And this could violate not only their integrity with the Lord by agreeing to something that they don't really agree to, it also serves as a very real, unseen, unspoken, but certainly felt block in the body. And it limits the worship. And it limits the beauty of the Spirit. Because unanimity has been confused for unity. In this situation, the Apostle Paul tells us, let every man be persuaded in his own mind. Finally, and ironically, the unanimity which we hoped would produce unity will serve only to further separate us. And besides that, maybe the worst thing that it does is it stops us from growing because it really limits the growth that can take place in us when we surround ourselves with people who merely parrot back to us that which we already believe. And the Holy Spirit has trouble interjecting anything else. Paul said we are laborers together. Together. <laughs> I mean, Christ did pay the same price for them that he paid for us. And if we're good enough for him, and if they're good enough for him, surely we ought to be good enough for each other. Isn't that so? <laughs> I, I'm excited about what God is doing as he lifts our gaze higher and we're with joy discovering each other in Christ. I, I have great joy in telling you that I've learned that there are 63 million Catholic charismatics in the world today. There are almost 20 million Anglican charismatics in the world today. And I have just heard of, a, of another group where the Holy Spirit is racing his way through. Now, now, there ought to be something in there that we can touch each other on. Something in the Spirit. Something that Christ already created when he broke down the middle wall of partition. And all we need to do is to discover it somehow. And I believe that the Lord is helping us to do that. But let's quickly rush on to the last point. We are laborers, point one, together, point two, with God, moving when God moves. These two are closely related. Working together with God and moving when God moves is saying almost the same thing. But I'd like to point out to you, did you notice that it does not say we are laborers together for God? It doesn't say that anywhere there. And there's a good reason for it. Because although Jesus entrusts his work to human beings, nevertheless, the Holy Spirit remains the transcendent and principal agent in this work. Praise God. Jesus said it best. He had been trying to make his disciples understand. He had given them examples. He had taught them. He had even provided object lessons. And somehow this lesson just seemed to be too tough. Well, now it was the eve of his crucifixion. What was going to happen? He was out of time. So he gathered around him his small group, those trusty ones that had not gone somewhere else, those few that had hung on to the end. And there in the candlelight of that communion room, as he's looking at these faces that have traveled from northern Israel into Jerusalem, tired and definitely worried by the events of that fateful week. 
he gathers them and I can see him leaning forward across the table and saying listen to me now you've got to understand this listen to me and as they all listen he says get this in your mind without me you can do nothing without me you're hopeless I'm the vine you're the branches if you separate the vine from the branch the branch is going to die get it in your heads without me you can't do anything hallelujah therefore we don't work for him we work with him the only road to success is working with the Lord Jesus Christ and the commission to go into all the world which which was the chief aim of the church in those days that commission was reported by all four of the gospel writers and they all had two things in common the one thing was a worldwide scope they were supposed to go all over the world everywhere to every nation preaching the kingdom they all had that in common but the second thing that they had in common was that the Lord told them when you go into all the world you won't be alone I will be with you and the Bible tells us in the book of Mark and they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them only as we are united to him as the branches in the vine will we be able to bring forth good fruit you see if Christ is in me then I have been made a partaker of the divine nature you have to look pretty far in to see it in me sometimes but it's there it's the promise of God the Apostle Peter told us if I'm born again I'm made a partaker of the divine nature Paul said Christ is in you well if that's so then living inside of me is the one who not only proclaimed the good news he was the good news the one who was the good news was a proclaimer of the good news and now he's living in me and if I have submitted my life to him then where will I naturally be found I'll be found in the field laboring together with God if he's in me that's where I'll be and if I am not found on the field wherever that field is because the whole world's the field if I'm not found there if you're not found there what is the inescapable conclusion to which, which we must arrive either Christ is not in us ooh, or he is not free in us to move when the Spirit moves requires a life in perfect alignment to God's Spirit that's true that's where we need to be please stay with me just for a couple more moments I'm almost through but oh I'm so glad to finally be able to deliver this I, I, I have truly felt it there was a time in the life of Jesus Matthew 11 records it John the Baptist was in prison and the prison that he had found himself in turned out to be death row he had heard what Jesus was doing but somehow it just hadn't sunk in he wasn't comfortable with the reports that he was hearing now he was a man who had grown in the wilderness whatever that really means he was a man who had a real relationship with the father who had recognized a prophetic call on his life and was in Jesus's words the greatest of the prophets well 
if he heard something that didn't measure up to what he had understood and what he had learned through his time with the Lord, it bothered him. Now he's in prison. The future is doubtful. And he's here to report. And so he sends two of his disciples, go to Jesus, find him, and ask him this, are you the one who should come or do we look for another one? They found Jesus, and, they ans and Jesus answered them and said, go and show John again. Notice that word again. <laughs> Apparently, John had been told this message before. But now he says, go and show John another time the things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And then, and then Jesus added another sentence. This one was aimed directly at John. He says, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. I think this is saying John is, has the worry of Jesus. And he's saying, I hope that John is willing to give up his preconceived ideas of what he thinks I should do and should be and not be offended in who I really am and what I am really doing. Yes. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus was worried. John had spent a lifetime doing his best to understand the Father and his will. When he saw Jesus, he called him out. He said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. When he baptized him, he knew who he was baptizing. He was thrilled with what was happening. He's the one that made confession of Jesus. And yet near the end, after all these years, Jesus seems to be a little bit worried and said, tell John that he's blessed if he will not be offended in the real Jesus, in what is really happening, in who I really am, and in what I am really doing. And perhaps, perhaps he's worried the same thing about some of us. The spiritual life is a is a, is a mystery we don't understand I don't understand things that I thought were right turned out somehow to not be as right as I thought they were I can't explain it I don't understand it but I, I do recognize a certain unity with with believers everywhere and and I believe that maybe God is worried about Chris that when he really begins to move, I'll pull back and say, whoa, that's not the way I understood it. That's not the way that I had always been taught it. That can't be right. And then he says, go to the book. Go to the book. I might show you something in here through the Spirit which will guide you into all the truth. Go to the book, man! And then when I read it, and I say, that's right! How did I miss it all along? Then, then the onus is on me. Either I have to go his way or mine. Could it be that the Father is concerned with some of us that in these last hours we might 
be offended with his son? Let's remember that he is bigger than we can conceive. <laughs> As Brother Wilson preached last year, I think, he's bigger than we can put into a box. And let's just be content to be amazed at the mystery and the majesty of God. I think we need to get back to the old idea that God is awesome. He, he's huge. He's bigger than I can understand. But when he reveals something to me, I've got to walk in it. We are laborers. We are laborers together. And we're laborers together with God. If our brother would come to the piano, I'd like to thank you for listening. And I, I believe the Spirit of the Lord is here. Oh, hallelujah. The Lord is here among us, and this is, this is something great. This could be one of the most important assemblies that we have ever seen. But I would like to invite you to join me tonight in prayer that God could be awesome among us and that if he wants to surprise us that instead of recoiling in horror, we'll say, God, you're even greater than we thought. You're so great, so much greater than the angels. Would you stand with me? If you don't know Jesus tonight, please don't leave yet. Would you come and seek him? Seek his face. Find him. He's here to be found. Stretch out your arms to him. He'll take those arms. He loves you. And what he's doing in the world right now is, is beautiful. He's not limited sometimes we are would you come and seek him i'd like to just declare this altar open and invite you to come if you don't know the lord if you haven't met jesus i'd like to invite you to come and meet him tonight he's here and we'll pray for you if if you need deliverance if you need to be freed from some bondage of sin, some limitation in your life, the Lord is here for that too. He loves you. And He'll work a miracle in your life. Yes. Amen. Won't you come? Won't you come? I know this is making a rather abrupt turn, but it's the same spirit. Won't you come and, and meet Him? He's here. And He's waiting for you. In fact, I think that many of us have been in travail and prayer and fasting for this week. All over the world, I know we have been in Greece. We've been concerned. We want the Lord to prevail. Maybe, maybe we should pray here also tonight. Would you join us? Would you come? Would you pray? Let's, let's talk to the Lord. Let's just 